All right, Ivan, you weren't here last time. Um, did you listen to the uh, the recording on uh, Remark Two? Uh, if not, or if so, any questions on on it before we just go on remark three? Uh, well, yeah, we're gonna start from the beginning again. Let me just quickly look over what remark three was about, because we we got somewhere I think like halfway. Yeah, I tried to listen to the last recording, uh, but I only did it with uh, uh, with uh, skipping and so. But uh, but I read the text so. All right. So long as it makes more or less sense. Uh, sorry about the recording. It's. Uh, it's really annoying and very hard to edit on a laptop. So there was a lot of dead space. Well, let's see, beginning of remark three. Uh, issues of becoming. Uh, See, um, we've all right. Well, I'm, I'm just gonna read the first uh, paragraph, remark three. The unity whose moments, being a nothing, are inseparable, is at the same time different from these moments. It thus stands as a third with respect to them, a third which, in its most proper form, is becoming. Transition is the same as becoming except that the two terms from one of which the transition is made to the other are represented in it more as at rest outside each other, the transition occurring between them. So... He's saying uh, transition is the same as becoming, except that the two terms from one from one of which the transition is made to the other are represented in it more as at rest outside each other. So, okay, uh, it's basically him explaining like uh, his typical like, well, why didn't I call it this? Uh, the reason he doesn't call it transition is because transition implies a static uh, division between the elements that transition. And that transition is something that is in between them as something separate. Whereas in becoming, Hegel doesn't want to say that. Hegel wants to say that the terms themselves really do transition. It's not something occurring between them. It is what occurs in them themselves. Now, wherever and however being are nothing being or nothing or at issue, this third must be there, for the two have no subsistence on their own, but are only in becoming. In this third. But this third has various empirical shapes that abstraction either sets aside or neglects for the sake of holding fast to its two products, being and nothing, each for itself and showing them as protected against. Transition. Such a simple maneuver of abstraction of abstraction can be countered with equal ease simply by pointing to the empirical concrete existence in which that abstraction itself is only a something has a determined existence. So just, uh, what was I?
So the whole thing about now, wherever and however, being or nothing are at issue. The third must be there, for the two have no subsistence on their own, but are only becoming in this third. So we, we so far have no ground for why Hegel is saying this, except for one thing, which is that in thinking being, it becomes nothing. In thinking nothing, it became being. And so if a thought has anything that makes it a thought at all, which has a content, then its content is currently uh, the very way it becomes. The thinking of a thought is its becoming. As far as uh, we so have, we have a thought about it so far. Sorry, I was just Sorry, just this last sentence is uh, interesting. Such a simple maneuver of abstraction can be countered with equally simply by pointing to empirical concrete existence, which that abstraction itself is only a something. What 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 does he mean by uh, that sentence? If you can. Yeah. Let's see. Um... But this third has various empirical shapes that abstraction either sets aside or neglects for the sake of holding fast to its two products, being and nothing, each for itself, and showing them as protected against. Transition. So this third being uh, becoming has various empirical shapes that abstraction either sets aside or neglects for the sake of holding fast to its products of being a nothing. So we're still talking about being a nothing, about how the regular understanding thinks they are completely different things which are separate and can each be had for itself and are thus protected against transition. Uh, the empirical forms he's talking about is basically uh, forms of becoming which are not recognized as becoming I think and uh, this becomes apparent later on uh, let me go to the next sentence such a simple maneuver of abstraction can be countered with equal ease simply by pointing to the empirical concrete existence in which that abstraction itself is only as something has a determined existence or else it is by virtue of other forms of reflection that this separation of the inseparable would be held fixed. But in any such determination of reflection, its opposite is present within it, in and for itself, and it is thus possible to refute it on its own terms without going back to the nature of the fact and appealing to it, by taking the determination as present itself, and by pointing to its other in it. So, this is alluding to something in chapter 2. Uh, but if you want the explanation right now, the explanation is becoming is all transition whatsoever. If you have any distinction, you actually have a transition. Like, the very fact that you can point out something specific already puts you as already having assumed becoming. Because if you couldn't tell, like... Uh, if there was nothing that was connecting things imminently, then you couldn't even distinguish things. Uh, you couldn't distinguish being a nothing if there wasn't some sort of middle line, so to say, in which you could say this is the side of being and this is the side of nothing. And it, it is at this point at which they differ. So imagine like a, a circle, uh, the line of the circle is the becoming of the circle. It both uh, denotes what is the inner of the circle and what is the outer of the circle. But what is the line itself? And, uh, you know, if you really go down to you try to determine what the hell the line is in some sort of like 
conceptual uh, idea of limitation, you know, the line is the limit between the inner and the outer, you find out that you actually don't actually, the very idea of the limit is something that's just a transition point, but it itself doesn't seem to have like any uh, definite uh, content that is fixed. So that would be the empirical empirical examples which people ignore and which they abstract from and thinking they oh well you know I've gotten rid of becoming you know they think that becoming is this thing of like things are always changing in a temporal way you know things become temporally with time and uh, we'll find out later no things don't just become temporally they become also in logical forms as in the very ways in which you transition you see transitions and differences is becoming itself uh, but isn't becoming unable to transition between being nothing uh, yes it will we'll find out once we get there Uh, does that answer the question, Ivan? Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah. Well, I, I'm I'm really having trouble with uh, just reading some um, uh, certain uh, uh, certain terms on English. That's it. Um, yeah. So far, like, don't worry too much if you don't understand uh, certain things. I mean, if there are specific terms, like, definitely ask me. Yeah, sure, but I, 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 I think I got it. I, I just need to read this a few times, so... All right. Okay. I, I, I'm not sure, but because my, it might be stupid, but uh, when he says that, but this third has various empirical shapes, that abstraction either sets aside or neglects, forsakes, or holding fast to two, two products. So, uh, obviously, he talks about... Uh, uh, becoming, uh, yeah. in yeah. reference to third. But w w what does he mean by empirical shapes? That uh, abstraction uh, sets aside. Uh, time. Time is an empirical shape of becoming. It's like the the first one you ask anybody, well, what is becoming? The almost universally, you'll get time as the first answer. Like uh, that is an empirical shape of becoming. Another empirical shape will any anything that flows in that way, anything that changes itself over time is going to be an empirical shape of becoming, empirical form of becoming. Um, I don't know about Heidegger. But I know Heraclitus, for example, Hegel claims that Heraclitus thought that time was the essence of all things. You know, Heraclitus, most people think it's fire, but I haven't read all the fragments of Heraclitus. I've only read some, so I don't know where he gets that from. But apparently he thinks to think, uh, seems to think it's a coherent idea. Yeah, his most famous saying is like, everything is moving or something like that. I'm not sure of English translation. Yeah. But for him, there is no being, there is no nothing, there is just, uh, in, in the, as I understand it, uh, he, he, for him is only becoming, that, that's the only. No, I think he does uh, acknowledge being a nothing. Uh, he but, uh, he uh, has, I, I know he has one line where he says, um, uh, he has uh, says that be, being doesn't exist, but that is rough far, uh, paraphrasing for me. So, yeah, I'm not yeah, sure. I'm not sure so. so, uh, do, do, do.
So uh, when he says such a simple maneuver abstraction can be countered with equal ease simply by pointing to the empirical concrete existence in which that abstraction itself is only a something has a determined existence. Uh, I think it seems to me like the key term there is determined existence, which is we're going to get to uh, chapter two. And uh, obviously, like you ought to notice that that's after becoming. So whatever existence is already incorporates becoming. To do continuing, uh, it would be a labor. It would be labor in vain to attempt to ensnare, so to speak, all the shifts and turns of reflection and its argumentation in order to preempt and, re and render impossible all the evasions and the leaps with which it hides its own contradiction from itself. For this reason, I also refrain from taking notice of the many self-styled objections and refutations that have been advanced against the claim that neither being nor nothing are something true, but that becoming is their truth. The intellectual education required to perceive the nothingness of these refutations or rather to dispel such arbitrary ideas on one's own, will be attained only through a critical cognition of the forms of the understanding. But those who are the most prolific in such objections straight away set themselves upon reflecting on the first propositions without helping themselves or having helped themselves through further study of the logic to the awareness of the nature of their crude reflections. We shall consider some of the cases that occur when being and nothing are posited in isolation, each outside the sphere of the other, with the result that the transition is negated. Parmenides held fast to being and was the most consistent since he also said of nothing that it absolutely is not, only being is totally for itself, being is thus determinate and has therefore no connecting reference to any other. Consequently, it seems that from this beginning no further forward move is possible, that is, from that beginning itself, and that an advance can only occur by adding something foreign to it from outside. The advance, where being is the same as nothing, thus appears as a second, absolute beginning, a transition which is for itself, and that would be added to being externally, being would not be an absolute beginning at all if it had a determinateness in that case. It would depend on another and would not be immediate, would not be the beginning. If, however, it is indeterminate and is therefore a true beginning, it has nothing by virtue of which it can pass over on to another, pass over to an other. As beginning, it is equally the end. It is just as impossible for anything to break out of it as to break into it. With Parmenides as with Spinoza, there is no advance from being or from absolute substance to the negative, the finite. If there is forward movement nevertheless, something which, as just remarked, can occur only externally if we start from be being devoid of any connecting reference, and so, without forward movement, then this advance is a second, new beginning. So if being is, and we're going to stick with being is, no no external determination or internal determination. There's nothing to think, there's nothing else to do. The beginning is the end, that is the end of philosophy as far as Parmenides can go. To get something else, you have to basically inject, inject things externally. Uh, thus, Fichte's most absolute unconditional first principle, A equals A, is a positing, a thesis. The second principle is a counterpositing, an antithesis. This latter should be partly conditioned, partly unconditioned, and so contradiction in itself. So, uh, Fichte's whole uh, absolute ego principles, the A is the first absolute ego, the second A is the posited ego for itself. 
So first this, there's this first moment which is supposedly absolute, but it doesn't yet exist. So in order to exist, it posits itself. The second positing is not the same as the first, is not the same thing as the first, yet it is the same thing. So the first absolute is somehow incomplete, cannot be complete without positing itself. The second thing is its completion. But if it depends on the second thing, the second A, then there's a contradiction between the absolute and, uh, you know, the unconditioned and the, the conditioned. Uh, does existence have being and nothing because an actual thing is what it is, but also what it is not? Uh, yeah. It, it'll be more nuanced than that, but yeah, it's basically... It's more or less correct. Uh, just continuing... This is an advance by external reflection that negates the absolute with which it makes its beginning. The counterpositing is the negation of the first identity, while at the same time equally reducing its second absolute explicitly to something conditioned. But if there were any justification at all for the advance, that is, for sublating the first beginning, then the possibility that an other could connect with it would have to lie in the nature of the first beginning itself. The beginning would have to be, therefore, a determinate beginning, but being, as also the absolute substance, will not be such, quite the contrary. Being is the immediate, the still absolutely indeterminate. And uh, we sp I spent a lot of time last time on this Jacobi section, so uh, it, it just, it's a reiteration of the same theme and the problem. So I'm going to skip that. Alright, so go to the bottom of page 74. Uh, yeah, fish this thing is really interesting. It, it makes a lot more sense when you read the, the full arguments for it. So skip to bottom of page 74. Uh, you can listen to the recording on the Jacobi stuff. Where do we start? Page 74, uh, the, the, the yeah, demonstration? At the, bottom. Uh, at the very bottom where it says, says, in the pure reflection of the beginning. All right, got it. Yep. In the pure reflection of the beginning, as it is made in this logic, with being as such, the transition is still hidden. Because being is posited as immediate, the nothing only breaks out in it immediately. All the subsequent determinations are, however, more concrete, like existence which follows right after. There is already posited in existence that which contains and produces the contradiction of those abstractions and consequently their transition in being when taken in that simplicity and immediacy the memory that it is the result of a perfect abstraction and that is therefore already abstract negativity nothing is left back behind the science which starting explicitly from essence will exhibit that one-sided immediacy as a mediated immediacy 
where being is posited as concrete existence, and that which mediates being, the ground, is also posited. So, I mean, it's just talking about stuff in the second book. Not stuff that we quite understand at this point. The uh, important thing there is uh, the immediacy of being and the immediacy of nothing within being. Or rather that uh, in th being, being, <laughs> God, that's such a weird way to say it, being, being an immediate thought, in thinking it, immediately is nothing. And uh, it's definitely the experience you think it, and there is no intermediate uh, to the experience or the thought in that moment. With the recovery of this memory, it is possible to represent the transition from being to nothing and also, as it is said, to clarify it and make it comprehensible as something itself easy and trivial. So uh, he's talking about the memory of uh, the logic of essence. So he's saying here we don't actually know... We don't actually see the transition between being and nothing. We don't actually uh, have it intelligibly. But uh, this will be made intelligible in the logic of essence. So, of course, the being which is made into the beginning of science is a nothing, since it is possible to abstract from everything. And when abstraction is made from all, nothing is left over. However, one can continue, so understood the beginning is nothing affirmative. Not being, but just nothing, and nothing is then the end, at least as much as immediate being, and even more so. So he's going on there about the various ways in which one could just arrive at this conclusion that being is nothing. You know, if you abstract from everything, obviously you have nothing, no thing. It's actually kind of what, basically what Heidegger did, which uh, is pretty clever. Apparently it wasn't new, apparently uh, others had noticed that before, but uh, I thought it was pretty clever for Heidegger to call it the no thing. But however one can continue, so understood the beginning, I did it. Shortest is to let such an argument run its course and to observe how the result of which it boasts takes shape. That nothing is the result of the argument, and that the beginning would then have to be made with nothing, as in Chinese philosophy, need not cause, a, cause us to lift a finger. For even before we had lifted it, this nothing would have turned into being just as much. That is, by starting with, like, well, you know, uh, in beginning, you know, at the, the foundations of everything, there is nothing. You've already contradicted it. Nothing is, therefore you've turned it into being. But further, if we presuppose the set abstraction from everything, and everything which is an existent, nevertheless, such an abstraction must be defined with greater exactitude. So, in regard to existence, nothing is non-existence, if existence is to be taken as being. So, at that point, you, you, can, you get how it makes sense. Oh, well, nothing isn't something that's you know, non-being makes perfect sense to have it as a as a being. You know, even though these it doesn't exist, it also isn't the case that it doesn't uh, <laughs> that it doesn't uh, exist, so to say. Uh, page 75. 
Uh, we skipped a section on Jacoby because we talked about it last time. Can you hear me? Uh, this part seems to reference philosophies that stop them being or nothing. Yeah. Uh, it's philosophies that take being and nothing as completely separate things uh, in themselves. Uh, continuing... Uh the result of such an abstraction from everything existence is first of all abstract being, being in general. For just as in the cosmological proof of the existence of God from the contingent being of the world, where we ascend above this contingent being, being is still taken up with us in the ascent. It is determined as infinite being. But of course, one can abstract also from this pure being. Being can be thrown in with the everything from which abstraction has already been made, and then nothing remains. Now, if we want to ignore the thinking of nothing, that is, that it turns around into being, or would know nothing of it, one can indeed proceed in this way in the style of the one can. One can, God be praised, even abstract from nothing. For the creation of the world, too, is an abstraction from nothing. But then what remains is not nothing, since abstraction would be made even from it, and so we would be back at being again. This one can generates an external play of abstraction in which the abstracting itself is only the one-sided activity of the negative. Directly implied in this very one can is that being is just as indifferent to it as nothing, and that as the one vanishes, the other appears in turn. But whether a beginning is made with the activity of nothing or with nothing is equally indifferent. For the activity of nothing that is, the mere abstracting is neither more nor less true than the mere nothing. That is one of the most enigmatic passages of the first chapter, in my opinion. Yeah, well, well it's quite interesting, but um, uh, uh, if I, I didn't, may, maybe, maybe I forgot from previous remarks or something like that. But uh, I'm interested in what was the mistake from previous philosophies? How, how they didn't uh, realize that uh, uh, nothing is uh, being co is contained in nothing, and nothing is contained in being. And uh, well, for Parmenides, it's simple. You know, Parmenides saw well. You know, if being is and nothing is not, then nothing cannot be and if nothing cannot be then there is nothing to be said about nothing uh, nothing is technically like Parmenides shouldn't even be able to speak about nothing because it, it simply is not because only being is so since uh, only being is where did Parmenides couldn't go anywhere you know uh, with everything you do it is 
thinking is, space is, matter is, mind is, spirit is, souls is, soul is, void is, everything is. Uh, there, there's no way to get out of it, and it, so from that standpoint, nothing cannot be. It, nothing is an illusion. There is no such thing as non-existence because it doesn't exist. It isn't. So that's Parmenides' mistake. Uh, here, I mean, he's going over a, a caricature of Chinese uh, Buddhist philosophy and uh, Taoist philosophy as well, about how uh, they say that the the ultimate reality is nothing. You know, the Buddhist uh, everything is emptiness. This nothingness, it has no actual positive being. You know, if you have something like, uh, say, the interdependence, uh, what is it called? Uh, the doctrine of a dependent arising, a phenomena, in which all phenomena are in themselves nothing and only exist within uh, these web of other phenomena, which themselves are also nothing, then you have this whole problem, well, you know, everything rests on nothing. But that's strange, isn't it? You know, the, you're you're basically there implicitly uh, using nothing as being, but you're using it in the sense that uh, you can't find any content, and uh, it is precisely in that you can't find any content within phenomena that it's that is uh, substantive that makes you say, "Oh, well, it's a bunch of nothing," but it still is. So to say, well, you know, nothing is the truth of everything, you've contradicted yourself. Because then you posited nothing as being. You know, nothing is the truth of everything. That's the problem. So um, I'd say, I guess, like the, the critique would be they didn't notice the performative contradiction. Uh, Parmenides didn't notice that in saying, well, being is, he didn't say anything, he didn't actually apprehend anything. And uh, the Chinese don't, don't notice that uh, the Asian Eastern philosophy doesn't notice that in uh, saying nothing is, it has also contradicted itself. So uh, to put it in terms of form and content, uh, Parmenides thinks he grasps content in form by just saying merely being is. Whereas the Eastern philosophy thinks it has grasped the content by accepting that indeed there is no content that they can tell. But they miss out that the form is in the, the form of being, necessarily. Um, after that, uh, the stuff in abstraction is uh, so he says, but further, if we presuppose the said abstraction from everything and everything which is in existence, nevertheless, such an abstraction must be defined with greater exactitude. The result of such an abstraction from everything existent is, first of all, abstract being, being in general. So, you know, you make a first absolute abstraction from everything. What's the one thing you can abstract? Well, you can abstract being, you know, infinite being. You know, for just as in the cosmological proof of the existence of God from the contingent being of the world, where we ascend above this contingent being, being is still taken up with us in the ascent. It is determined as infinite being. So, you know, you say, well, all of existence, you know, is ephemeral. It is banishes its becoming. It's an illusion. But, you know, being as such, infinite being, you know, doesn't vanish. It's always there. Uh, it's the real substance. 
but of course one can abstract also from this pure being. Being can be thrown in with everything from which abstraction has already been made and then nothing remains. So you can abstract from all beings and get being, but obviously you, if you're playing the game of abstraction, you don't have to stop there. You can go and say, oh, well, if I can abstract from beings, I can abstract from being itself. A being can be, over, can be thrown in with everything from which abstraction has already been made, and then nothing remains. But now if we want to ignore the thinking of nothing, that is, that it turns around into being, or would know nothing of it, one can indeed proceed in this way, in the style of the one can. So, uh, if you just ignore the thinking of being, uh, this is another way in which you can get to the identity of being and nothing, basically. If you thought being, you get nothing, and if you think nothing, well, you obviously get being. Uh, the way in which that happens is different for each one, but nonetheless, it, it, it does happen. Uh, but if you don't think about it, you can still get it by abstracting, because you can abstract all the way to being from all existent beings, and from being, you can then abstract again, get nothing, and since, hey, one can keep abstracting, you can abstract from nothing all the way back to being. Because, as Hegel says, one can, God be praised, even abstract from nothing, for the creation of the world too is an abstraction from nothing. But then what remains is not nothing, since abstraction would be made even from it, and so we would be back at being again. You know, I mean, basically think about it. What would it mean to abstract from nothing? There is nowhere else to go except one other way. The only way to abstract from nothing is to go right back to being. And you can just keep this endless game of abstraction. You know, abstract from being to nothing, abstract from nothing back to being. So he says this one can generates an external play of abstraction in which the abstracting itself is only the one-sided activity of the negative. So abstraction is one external way in which you can get what seems like this movement of the identity of being and nothing as both being empty, mere signifiers, you know, they don't actually have any content. And abstraction is only in reference to what is intended. And so, uh, abstraction is just an external activity negation. Uh, directly implied in this very one can is that being is just as indifferent to it as nothing, and that as the one vanishes, the other appears in turn. But whether a beginning is made with the activity of nothing or with nothing is equally indifferent for the activity of nothing, that is, the mere abstracting is neither more nor less true than the mere nothing. So to the activity of abstraction, being and nothing are just as good as each other. They are one and the same. They're indifferent to it. And uh, the enigmatic thing for me is like that last piece, but whether a beginning is made with the activity of nothing or with nothing is equally indifferent. For the activity of nothing, this is abstraction or negativity, negation, that is the mere abstracting is neither more nor less true than the mere nothing. And I think this can be linked back to the beginning of being a nothing. Remember how we got nothing? Nothing actually originates in an activity. It actually is an activity. It is the thinking of being. You know, what nothing was was this empty thinking of being.
yeah, still, it's quite interesting that he started with being and not nothing. And uh, I think that uh, directly implies that uh, uh, because I, I think it will be entirely justified that he, uh, th that he could have started from nothing. Uh, but he started from being the, that in some sense, I think it, 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 it greater implies nothing. It's uh, more, more strange, maybe, to say at least. I think he actually does go on to say that it doesn't matter where you begin. You could have begun with nothing or being. And in this case, I think nothing is a stranger one than uh, compared to being. Because by saying being is nothing, uh, we've already seen all the different ways in which it, this can actually make perfect sense and which other philosophers before him already acknowledged. You know, being is no thing, being is not a specific thing. You know, if you take nothing as that, then sure. You know, being isn't anything determinate, sure. But with nothing, nothing is where uh, Hegel really kind of has this this his own radical difference and where uh, there is a strange dialect there is a a direct dialectic in which uh, it's like the liar paradox you want to say something and you end up saying the exact opposite without intending Uh, question is, do you think we can say nothing is being because being is nothing? Or do we have to say that nothing is in order to say nothing is being? I think it's the latter. Because the first one, like I was saying right now, uh, could be understood in various ways such that it is actually not considered contradictory. But the one that like definitely is contradictory immediately is nothing is no it's like the liar paradox in which uh, you say uh, well you know all Americans are liars and I'm an American and I tell you well I'm a liar I just told you the truth therefore I can't be a liar but if I told you that I would tell you the truth then obviously I'm a liar. So contradiction happens regardless of how you put it. So uh, nothing in, in the function of nothing is, is a liar's paradox. Uh, it performatively contradicts itself. But of course, it's only a liar's paradox if you take the, the standard view that nothing and being are completely different things that are opposites.
All right, well, I'll continue reading while you're writing your comments. So, um, I don't know. I would actually highlight this, that last se sentence. Uh, For the activity of nothing that is, the mere abstracting is neither more nor less true than mere nothing. Because I just think that's... That is definitely one of those, like, super Hegelian, like... Not very clear things. But it, it seems to be very meaningful. Uh, so, continuing... Plato's dialectical treatment of the One and the Parmenides must also be regarded rather as a dialectic of external reflection. Being and the One are both Eleatic forms which are the same thing. But as Plato understands them in that dialogue, they are also to be distinguished after he removes from the One the various determinations of whole and parts, of being in itself, of being in another, etc., of figure, time, etc. His result is that being does not pertain to the One, for being does not accrue to a something except according to one of these forms. Plato then turns to the proposition, the one is, and it is there that we can see how, starting from this proposition, he performs the transition to the non-being of the one. It happens by way of a comparison between the two determinations of the presupposed proposition, namely, the one is. This proposition contains the one and being, but the one is contains more than when one only says the one. In this, in their being distinguished, the moment of negation is demonstrated. It is clear that this method has a presupposition and is an external reflection. So in the one and being, uh, there is a contradiction between being and nothing because somehow the one is considered to be prior to being. Uh, being here is taken to be a predicate which accrues to the one. So if being is absent, well then the one is nothing. So is that more or less clear? All right, continuing. Uh, just as the one is posited here in combination with being, so is being which should be held fast abstracted by itself in the simplest form without entering into thought exhibited in a combination that entails the opposite of what should be asserted. Taken in its immediacy, being belongs to a subject, is something said, has an empirical existence in general, and therefore stands on a ground of restriction and negativity. Whatever the expressions or the turns of phrase that the understanding adopts in protesting against the unity of being and nothing, however much it appeals to what is immediately given, it will find precisely in this experience nothing but determinate being, being with a restriction or negation, the very unity which it rejects. The assertion of immediate being thus comes down to an empirical concrete existence, and it cannot reject the demonstration of it, since it is the immediacy outside thought to which it wants to cling. So while for Hegel, immediate being is this abstract, indeterminate, undifferentiated, undifferentiated uh, concept, uh, being as it was treated prior to him was always actually an immediate, determinate concept. And since determinacy r requires a restriction or a negation, 
and this is where this thing that I said was interesting earlier that the activity of nothing and nothing are indifferent they're the same if there is a restriction then there is a non-being to be determined is to be restricted restricted eh, restricted it is to be defined and as such because it is restricted and defined it has been negated and because it has been negated therefore it is in contact directly with its nothing it is a being infused with nothing So to say the one, you already have to have to determine it as the one. It's already therefore in existence. It's a determinate being. It itself already is both being and nothing in itself. And then to say is, is just kind of just missing the point. Uh, but of course, when you say the one is, what is being meant is uh, what Hegel calls concrete existence, which is to be understood as what we normally call existence, which is empirical existence as opposed to like a possible existence. someone's comments this seems like a problem of thinking we can never grasp concrete reality without abstracting from it yes it's also the case however that uh, though I, it can't be proven here yet uh, I think it's also the case that the world abstracts from itself already like in order to have differentiated things they must be self-abstracting So keep in mind that nothing is as activity and nothing as, you know, sort of substance or whatever. There's a dynamic nothing as negation and then there's kind of a static nothing as the, uh, the other of being. Uh, continuing, the same is the case with nothing, only in the contrary way. This is a well-known reflection, made often enough respecting nothing. When taken in, in its immediacy, nothing shows itself as existing, for it is by nature the same as being. Nothing is thought of, represented, it is spoken about, it therefore is. Nothing has its being in thinking, representing, speaking, etc., but further, this being is also distinguished from it. It is therefore said that nothing is indeed in thinking or representing, yet for that very reason it is not it which is. It is not it to which being belongs, that only thinking or representing are this being. Even on this distinction, there is no denying that nothing refers to a being. But in this reference, though the latter equally also contains distinction, there is a unity with being. In whatever way nothing is set or demonstrated, it shows itself in combination with or, if one prefers, in touch with a being, unseparate, unseparated from a being, that is to say, precisely in a determinate existence. So apparently that reflection is not that common nowadays, apparently. Because uh, 
the other friends of mine who I've talked to this about don't seem to have ever had that reflection about that weird conversation that comes up once in a while in high, like middle school apparently I I actually had that come up where people talked well you know but if you can like name nothing then nothing is so it exists in your mind or you know it was this obvious simple language contradiction like it's it's a very simple thing to notice but apparently not many people notice it I guess not nowadays But anyways, when he says, even on this distinction, there is no denying that nothing refers to a being, but in this reference, the latter equally also contains distinction, there is a unity with being. In whatever way nothing is set or, de or demonstrated, it shows itself in combination with, or if one prefers, in touch with a being, unseparated from a being, that is to say, precisely in determinate existence. And uh, you can just give a myriads of empirical examples. You know, you go somewhere, you, somebody gives you a glass, and you know, you expect... You look at the glass and you say, oh, this glass is empty. There's nothing in it. That nothing is only nothing in respect to the expectation of the void being filled in the glass. You know, you go to open your door and you see, you know, bell rings or something. And you say, well, you open the door, no one's there. You know, nothing is there. Nobody's there. It's, it's only the expectation of a being that there is nothing. But likewise, being is the same way, that it's only in the expectation of a nothing that it makes sense to be talking about there was something. So the point there is that being and nothing are always uh, taught in conjunction. Uh, yeah, children do actually have, do have that thinking. Uh, and it's because they have genuine thinking. Like, this is how genuine thinking works. Like, I, I wrote a piece uh, a couple of days ago. Well, I finished out a piece and I put it on my blog about how Hegel intends to teach you how to think by just making you think and realize that this is, this is how you think, like all the time, you just don't realize it. Uh, continuing uh, continuing but when the presence of nothing in a determinate existence is thus demonstrated the distinction of it from being still commonly comes to mind namely that the existence of the nothing is nothing at all that pertains to it per se it is said that nothing does not have being in it, that it is not being as such, that it is rather an absence of being, just as darkness is only the absence of light, cold only the absence of warmth, and so forth. It is said that darkness has only meaning, has meaning only with reference to the eye, by being externally compared with a positive, with light, just as cold is something only in our sensation, whereas light, warmth, just like being, are on the contrary objective on their own. They are the real, the effective, of quite another quality and dignity than those negatives, than nothing. So, this is also a simple thing to notice, that the intention of saying nothing is to speak of the absence of being, but you don't want to say it as a positive absence. You just want to say it as a mere absence. 
And uh, this is the immediate way that well, you can, one answers, well, what is nothing, you know, this problem? It's a simple thing. You know, uh, if you think formally uh, and you know what you intend, it's very obvious that exactly it, you, you don't intend anything positive. So it makes no sense to you to think that it, of it as anything positive because you don't you abstract from how you actually use it. And so you start having to make explanations as to why you must speak with these false word games and why you actually have to think in this way despite knowing full well at least if you're a philosopher apparently realizing that you're not actually talking about anything So, you know, if you say, well, uh, when you go and you open the door, you look at your glass and you say, oh, there's nothing there. You know, you're actually, you're only noticing the absence of an expectation. It's not a real thing. You know, the absence is just, you're noticing that what you expected wasn't there. It's not a noticing that there is nothing there. All right, so you have to make explanations as to why you know, how strange language is and how that, that's that's kind of a false way to to think about it. It's very confusing. It naturally confuses. Continuing one can often find it advanced at a very weighty ref as a very weighty reflection and a significant item of cognition that darkness is only absence of light, cold only absence of warmth. Regarding this astute reflection, it can be observed empirically in this field of empirical subject matters that darkness in fact shows its effective presence in light by determining it as color and thereby imparting visibility to it in the first place because, as we said above, one can see just as little in pure light as in pure darkness. This is a, a reference to Goethe's theory of color. Hegel was in huge denial about Newton being right, about the nature of colors as specific uh, wavelengths of light. But we can also definitely, uh, it still makes sense though, if you take this darkness as being uh, kind of what splits light. Just to note why he's saying this color thing, uh, there's a video, it's a really nice documentary, very interesting, uh, about Goethe's theory of color. And uh, one of the ex basic experiments Goethe did was basically an inverted prism experiment. Rather than splitting up a beam of light, he just looked through a prism at stuff. And uh, in that mode, he saw it that colors only showed up between... Uh, surfaces that had connections like were in between white and dark so if you put a, a dark line on a white background you only saw colors around that black line so this is why he's saying that only between light and darkness does color arise therefore darkness has its own uh, being So it's not a completely erroneous uh, judgment, but it is a phenomenal uh, one based on a specific phenomena.
to do continuing visibility however is an f is an, an effect in the eye and the said negative makes just as much of a contribution to it as does the light that passes for the real the positive similarly cold makes itself present enough to water to our sensation and so forth and if we deny this so-called objective reality we thereby stand to gain absolutely nothing against it and we should further repeat the complaint that there that here the talk is again of a negative with determinate content that one has not restricted oneself to the nothing with respect to which so far as empty abstraction goes being is neither at a loss nor at advantage but we must equally take cold darkness and similar determinate negations just for themselves and in respect to their general determination which is at issue here let us see what is positive thereby another way way to take that is to say well the f physically you may want to speak of uh, cold as merely the absence of heat which is movement of atoms you know whatever but phenomenally experientially that is not your experience at all you feel cold like it's not some sort of illusion of an absence of heat cold is something that is a different feeling than heat by far so it, it is positive existence you see darkness just as much as you see light or um and white so to speak of them as their natures being just mere absences is phenomenally speaking uh, disingenuous Continuing, they are supposed to be not nothing in general, but the nothing rather of light, warmth, so forth, of something determinate, of a content. Thus they are a determinate, contentful nothing, if one may so speak. A determinateness, however, as f will be found later on, is itself a negation. Thus they are negative nothings. A negative nothing is, however, something affirmative. The conversion of nothing into an affirmative by virtue of its determinateness, which previously, previously appeared as a determined existence in a subject or in what have you, appears to a consciousness bound to the abstraction of the understanding as the greatest paradox. Simple as it is, or rather because it is, of its very simplicity, the insight that the negation of negation is something positive appears a trivial matter to which the haughty understanding need pay no heed even though its correctness is undeniable in not just its correctness but also on account of the universality of the determinations involved it is infinite extension and universal applicability so that it would indeed be well to pay heed to it So this rule of the unity of being a nothing is universal. It is a category. And it is a fundamental category that will apply to absolutely everything. Hello, can you still hear me? All right.
All right, sorry. Continuing. Uh, regarding the determination of the transition of being and nothing into each other, the further remark can be made that such a transition is to be taken just as it is without additional reflective determination. It is immediate and entirely abstract on account of the abstractness of the moments in transition, that is, because there is yet to be posited in these moments the determinateness of the other through which they have undergone the transition. Nothing is not yet posited in being, even though being is essentially nothing, and the other way around. Notice the italics, positing, and essence are obviously structures of a logic of essence. So the truth of being and nothing in their transitionary, the real transition doesn't fully get articulated until the logic of essence. It is, therefore, improper to apply here more determinate mediations and to take being and nothing in some relation. The transition is not yet a relation. Thus, it is inadmissible to say nothing is the ground of being or being is the ground of nothing. Nothing is the cause of being and so forth or in the transition into nothing can have occurred only under the condition that, or the transition into nothing can have occurred only under the condition that something is or the transition to being only under the condition of non-being. The mode of the, connection ref the connecting reference cannot be further determined without the connecting sides being at the same time also further determined. The connection of ground and consequent and so forth no longer has mere being and nothing for the sides which it binds, but has been expressly as ground and something which, although only posited and not standing on its own, is, however, not abstract nothing. So basically, we won't fully understand what absolute being and absolute nothing, or at least the closest to those, really transition as until logic of essence. But uh, c can we talk about absolute being or absolute nothing? It seems that uh, the absolute being and absolute nothing are impossible because every time you, every time you say uh, nothing, you come to being, and every time you say being, you come to nothing. So are there just like false moments or something like that? Yeah, yeah. By that, uh, I mean, I, I phrased it wrong. They're not absolute. Uh, obviously, the, the being and nothing will be tied all the way through until the end of the book. So each on their own, the, they're not absolute. All right, that is end of remark three. Now, let's see how long remark four is. Not that long. So, one can gather from the proceeding what to think of the dialectic directed against the beginning of the world and also its end, that dialectic which would prove the eternity of matter, that is, of the dialectic directed at becoming, against coming to be or passing away in general. To do Kant's antinomies regarding the finitude of the infinity of the world in space and time will be more closely considered below under the concept of quantitative infinity. This simple common dialectic rests on fixing the position of being and nothing. That a beginning of the world or of anything is not possible is proven as follows. Nothing can begin either insofar as something is or insofar as it is not. 
For insofar as it is, it does not begin to be. And insofar as it is not, it also does not begin to be. If the world or anything had begun, it would have begun in nothing. But in nothing there is no beginning, or nothing is not a beginning. For a beginning implies a being, but nothing contains no being. Nothing is only nothing. In a ground, a cause, and so on, if this is how nothing is determined, there is contained an affirmation, being. For the same reason, too, something cannot cease to be. For then it would have to contain nothing, but being is only being, not the opposite of itself. Makes sense. It is clear that in this proof there is nothing brought against becoming, or beginning and ceasing to be, against this unity of being and nothing, except an assertorical denial, and the ascription of truth to being and nothing, taken in separation each from the other. Well, I think this last line is... Um kind of interesting what he wants to say that you can take being and nothing in separation because this there you can't come to productive thoughts if you do that as mentioned in the uh, last paragraph And let's see, let me finish this paragraph. Uh, such a dialectic is, however, at least more consistent than ordinary reflective thought. This thought accepts as the whole truth that being and nothing are only in separation, yet allows, on the other hand, for a beginning and a ceasing to be that are equally accepted as true determinations. In these, however, it in fact assumes the inseparability of being and nothing. Once we presuppose that being and nothing are absolutely divorced, beginning or becoming, as we often hear said, is of course incomprehensible. For we make a presupposition which does away with beginning or becoming and yet again admits it. In this contradiction, which we create ourselves and make impossible to resolve, this is what is called the incomprehensible. The dialectic just cited is also the same as the understanding deploys against the concept of infinitesimal magnitude given by higher analysis. More will be said below about this concept. These magnitudes are so determined that they are in their vanishing, not before this vanishing, for they would then be finite magnitudes, not after it, for then they would be nothing. Against this pure thought, it is objected and endlessly repeated that these magnitudes are either something or nothing, that there is no intermediate state between being and nothing, state here being State is here an inappropriate, barbaric expression. Assumed here is again the absolute separation of being and nothing, but we have shown against this that being and nothing are in fact the same, or to speak in the language cited, that there is nothing which is not an intermediary state between being and nothing. Mathematics owes its most brilliant success to precisely that determination which the understanding rejects. So, but what he said earlier about the incomprehensible, which is that uh, first we say being and nothing are utterly completely separate and opposed, but then we think about this constant of beginning and we admit to it, but we also admit to that fact that if we have, if the being and nothing are completely separate, there is no beginning and there can be no end. It, being does not cease to be, being does not begin to be, being is, that is that. So in order to have anything about becoming, we have to have this connection between being and nothing. And that, that's also a reason why Kant got stuck on those antinomies and he co couldn't say, is the world, world finite or is the world infinite? I think that that's what he tr tries to say, that uh, he took uh, being and nothing as separate and uh, 
it's it's not it's not possible to derive uh, po po position that uh, for example world the world is infinite and uh, the world is finite in the same time but they're as I said, they are both logically valid, so... Yeah. But, but if we take principle of identity of being a nothing, it, uh, we arrive at a completely different result. Yeah, it makes the world a fin a, an infinite finite, or a finite infinite. Which is exactly what Hegel's infinite is. Well, yeah, I, I think it's uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, it's it's kind of good because uh, uh, when you look at the concrete reality, you you can't like you, you can't just abstract one part of it. You won't get full reality by it, and. Uh, the beautiful thing about this method is that uh, you get think in a sort of way thinking and uh, uh, th those like uh, two co that two contradictory views of, of the world they merge together in some way. Yeah, the beautiful thing is that is it it, it can be shown to emerge out of itself to be contradictory and yet coherent. It's contradictory from one point of view, but it's coherent from another. So continuing uh, this form of argumentation that falsely presupposes the absolute separation of being and nothing and insists on it should be called not dialectic, but sophistry. For sophistry is an argumentation derived from a baseless presupposition rashly accepted without critique, but we call dialectic the higher rational movement in which these, being and nothing apparently utterly separated, pass over into each other on their own by virtue of what they are and the presupposition that sublates itself. It is a dialectic, imminent nature of being and nothing themselves to manifest their unity, which is becoming as their truth. So Kantian dialectic is taking opposites, splitting them as if they were completely separate, proving each one separately, you know, which is what Sophists did. Sophists, you know, bragged about being able to do this with every, anything. You know, they said, well, I'll convince you of one thing today, and I'll convince you of the opposite tomorrow. So, uh, technically, he's, cor he's correct in calling this sophistry. Uh, two the moments of becoming. Becoming is the unseparatedness of being and nothing, not the unity that abstract from being, abstracts from being and nothing. As the unity of being and nothing, it is rather this determinate unity or one in which being and nothing equally are. However, inasmuch as being and nothing are each unseparated from, each, from its other, each is not. In this unity, therefore, they are, but as vanishing only as sublated. They sink from their initially represented self-subsistence into moments which are still distinguished but at the same time sublated. Grasped as thus distinguished, each is in their distinguishedness a unity with the other. Becoming thus contains being and nothing as two such unities, each of which is itself unity of being and nothing. The one is being as immediate and as reference to nothing, the other is nothing as immediate and as reference to being. In these unities, the determinations are of unequal value. Yes, for sublation, uh, this is something uh, Hegel was just in, in the habit of, I suppose, like pretty like right before he's about to define something he'll start using it without defining it but he'll define it soon enough and uh, notice how this new term sublation comes in as we have a third term uh, the reason why is because now like sublation also is a constructed term it is it, it isn't brought in from nowhere 
it is a term brought in precisely just how every other term has been brought in, which it fits a structure which we have acquired and built up. So sublation is the term which now fits the structure of what becoming relation to being a nothing is. But yeah, sublation is uh, to uh, cancel and uphold. Well, cancel and preserve is the main one he's going to use here. It cancels the contradiction, but it preserves it. So continuing, becoming is in this way doubly determined. In one determination, nothing is the immediate, that is, the determination begins with nothing, and this refers to being, that is to say, it passes over into it. In the other determination, being is the immediate, that is, the determination begins with being, and this passes over into nothing, coming to be and ceasing to be. So, um... I just want to go over a little bit backwards. Just retread. Um, so back from the top, becoming is the inseparateness of being a nothing. So we know it's you know their unity, not the unity that abstracts from being and nothing. As the unity of being and nothing, it is rather this determinate unity. So you know we have a we have a definition for once unlike with being and nothing where we have no definition, or one in which being and nothing equally are. So as determinate that they are, however, in as much as being and nothing are each unseparated from its other, each is not. So in this unity which they have, they both exist and they don't exist. So they are and are not at the same time. In this unity, therefore, they are, but as vanishing, only as ablated. They sink from their initially represented self-subsistence into moments which are still distinguished, but at the same time, sublated. So distinguished means that they're still held separate, but sublated means that they're brought into unity in this cancellation of their separation. Alright, continuing on, uh, grasp as us distinguish, each is in their distinguishedness, a unity with the other. Becoming thus contains being and nothing as two such unities. Each of which is itself unity of being and nothing, the one is being as immediate, yada yada. So notice how we get becoming, the, the structure of becoming is gotten by looking at the movement between of what happened in thinking being and nothing. In being, in thinking being, we thought nothing, so there's that unity. In thinking nothing, we thought being, so there's that unity. And those are two unities because of their order. Their order is inverted, that's why they are, uh, he says, uh, they're unequal. So that's ceasing to be and coming to be. Both are the same, becoming, and even as directions that are so different, they, are, they interpenetrate and paralyze each other. The one is ceasing to be, being passes over into nothing, but nothing is just as much the opposite of itself, the passing over into being, coming to be. So in the thinking of being, it passes over into nothing. In the thinking of nothing, it passes over into being. So um, the, the construction from the, the first elements is clear. You know, we actually do have a solid logical connection going on.
This coming to be is the other direction. Nothing goes over into being, but being equally sublates itself and is rather the passing over into nothing. It is ceasing to be. They do not sublate themselves reciprocally, the one sublating the other externally, but each rather sublates itself in itself and is within it the opposite of itself. Uh, Self-sublation here is an explicit uh, imminent becoming of... It's God, it's hard talking about it without saying becoming. It's the imminent, explicit being the other. The meaning of being here, the side of being is ceasing to be, the side of nothing is coming to be. The meaning, the very content of coming to be and ceasing to be is already explicitly to be transitioning into the other. That is why it is a self-sublation rather than an external sublation. It already determines itself to be becoming the other. So ceasing to be is being passing over into nothing. This is the explicit meaning of ceasing to be. That is why it is a self-sublation. In its very meaning, its content, it already holds its other within it. And so from itself, from within itself, it becomes the other. So being rather than negating, I think, is rather ne negating being itself in itself so, or something like that. Yes, it negates it's itself in into nothing. It, it negates uh, nothing that is uh, uh, contained in being in some sense, as I understand it. Mm, well, no, it's the nothing which is contained in being which negates being, but since it is not a nothing that is external to it, it is a self-negation, a self-sublation. So to repeat the thing, if we take the side of nothing here, or the, the side of being here to be, being is ceasing to be. Uh, by ceasing to be, we mean the entirety of being. The meaning of ceasing to be is being passing over into nothing. So in the very meaning of the concept, it's already done. The sublation has already happened from within itself of its own accord. So it's a self-sublation. It's not that nothing is outside and sublates being. No, being sublates itself by being this explicit internal connection with nothing. But uh, why is that important? Because it's a structural movement, you know, so self-sublations will occur, it tells you what to look out for. So uh, it's one other thing in which uh, it's also something you don't often hear. Uh, you he you know, like you've heard of sublations, you've probably never heard of self-sublations, in which you hear that something sublates something else, but in this case, the something sublates itself and becomes its other. But still, without uh, if we only had one, if we only had being, it it would uh, it couldn't self sublate. I I I mean, it can only in correlation to to nothing in some sense. We can we need to counterpose nothing. We can't just get being and get becoming. Yeah, yeah. You definitely need uh, you definitely need that first movement between you know, being and nothing. But once you have that and you know that this is an imminent movement and you conceptualize that as becoming, then you have this, the only way you can conceptualize that is in a determinate way, as definable, as definable is precisely as this self-sublation. That the only advance that you can make from being and nothing and they're vanishing into each other is to then take the directionality of vanishing and define becoming in that term. So becoming's being is defined according to being vanishing to nothing or passing over into nothing. 
and becoming nothing is defined as nothing passing over into being because that is the only advance we can't keep it in the original form of just like being vanishes to nothing nothing vanishes to being the only advance we can make is to take that whole movement as a whole and turn that into a new concept because it's the only thing that has a new a new uh, content I mean, is that more or less clear? Because, I mean, this is important, so I want to clarify it as much as possible. Actually, uh, yeah, so what I said here at the last point, that's what I actually want to say. Self-sublations are internal unities of the opposites. So nothing is a unity of nothing and being, as nothing vanishing to being. That is why it is a self-sublation. I mean, that's what the technicality is for.
So um, what to note there is that in becoming, being and nothing are re-articulated. We're not talking about the being and nothing at the beginning anymore. In becoming, being and nothing are re-articulated as this unity of being and nothing in the vanishing. So being is, ce being is ceasing to be. Nothing is coming to be. So it is in a explicit unity with its other, and it also transitions to the other. And th does that make more sense? Is that clear? All right, now that's the easy part. <laughs> this is going to be the hard part. Three, sublation of becoming. The equilibrium in which coming to be and ceasing to be are poised is in the first place becoming itself. But this becoming equally collects itself in quiescent unity. Being and nothing are in it only as vanishing. Becoming itself, however, is only by virtue of their being distinguished. The vanishing is therefore the vanishing of becoming, or the vanishing of the vanishing itself. Becoming is a ceaseless unrest that collapses into quiescent result. Okay, so I'm just gonna Google quiescent. Uh, quiescent just means that at, it's at rest. It's, you know, it's not turbulent, it's quiet. So if becoming is this restless movement, now it's going to become, it's going to come to a halt and be at rest. So in this first paragraph, I mean, uh, the equilibrium which coming to be and ceasing to be are poised is in the first place becoming itself. So ceasing to be and coming to be are endless. They, they continually keep going. Like there is no stop. Immediately being becomes and it becomes nothing and nothing becomes and it becomes being. Ceasing to be com becomes coming to be and coming to be becomes ceasing to be. I immediately there is no rest from those positions. If being and nothing are just that, ceasing to be and coming to be, then all there is, is nothing but vanishing. But this becoming equally collects itself in quiescent unity. So what's the only thing that doesn't vanish? Apparently, vanishing doesn't vanish. Being and nothing are in it only as vanishing. Becoming itself, however, is only by virtue of their being distinguished. That is a key sentence. Being and nothing are in it only as vanishing. Becoming itself, however, is only by virtue of their being distinguished. Their vanishing is therefore the vanishing of becoming, or the vanishing of the vanishing itself. So becoming only exists if being and nothing are actually distinct, if they aren't this endless self-sublation which just vanishes endlessly. If being and nothing are just this vanishing, then becoming, which is the vanishing as a whole, itself vanishes. So becoming is a ceaseless unrest that collapses into a quiescent result. So there's one interpretation of how becoming becomes being. This can also be expressed thus. Becoming is the vanishing of being into nothing and of nothing into being, and the vanishing of being and nothing in general. But at the same time, it rests on their being distinct. It therefore contradicts itself in itself, because what it unifies within itself is self-opposed, but such a union destroys itself. So if there is pure vanishing and nothing but vanishing, 
What does vanishing do? It vanishes. The vanishing vanishes itself. The explanation of, in that second paragraph is if becoming is the vanishing of being and into nothing and of nothing to being and the vanishing of being and nothing in general that is that being and nothing have vanished because they are nothing but ceasing to be and coming to be but at the same time it rests on their being distinct this is a contradiction you know it, it in order for it, things to vanish there must be distinct things to vanish into it therefore contradicts itself in itself because what it unites within itself is self-opposed. But such a union destroys itself. So this imminent unity of ceasing to be and coming to be destroys itself. This result is a vanishedness, but it is not nothing. As such, it would be only a relapse into a one of the already sublated determinations and not the result of nothing and of being. It is the unity of being and nothing that has become quiescent, simplicity but this quiescent simplicity is being yet no longer for itself but as determination of the whole so becoming the vanishing vanishes if being a nothing as a whole vanished too which is what happens happened in becoming being a nothing for us could only be determinate in this ceasing to be and coming to be as their only determinate relation but since that destroys being a nothing it vanishes them too they, they themselves are nothing but vanishings therefore the vanishing vanishes but where does that leave us that leaves us either that leaves us back with nothing right I mean you see how that happens Yeah, all right. I, I mean, this is actually considered like one of the most difficult passages in the logic. And uh, I've, I, I've seen at least three interpretations and like every time I go back to it, I'm not quite sure which one is the right one. I, I think each one captures the spirit of what is supposed to happen. It's just... It's not very clear. I mean, the, the, since this is, you know, I mean, there's this is all that's going to be said about becoming. By the way, <laughs> this is it. Um, so I'm going to go over. Let me just go over it again. And uh, you guys definitely need to take notes on this. For the first paragraph. No, becoming does not disappear. Uh, you'll you'll see what happens. Okay, so from the top.
No, becoming is everywhere after this. So, from the top, the equilibrium in which coming to be and ceasing to be are posited is in the first place becoming itself. So, you know, ceasing to be and coming to be happen because their equilibrium, their totality is what becoming is. Becoming is both ceasing to be and coming to be. That is the totality of becoming. Uh, you can't have just becoming which is coming to be or becoming that is just ceasing to be. Becoming is both coming to be and ceasing to be. So their equilibrium is in the first place becoming itself. But this becoming equally collects itself in quiescent unity. Being and nothing are in it only as vanishing. Becoming itself, however, is only by virtue of their being distinguished. Their vanishing is therefore the vanishing of becoming or the vanishing of the vanishing itself. Becoming is a ceaseless unrest that collapses into quiescent unity. There's two ways to interpret this and they both make sense but I do think one of them makes more sense than the other. The first way to interpret this is on that second line, but this becoming equally collects itself in quiescent unity. If becoming is as a whole, which contains being a nothing, becoming which contains being a nothing, as a whole, is nothing but vanishing. And it is just this incessant vanishing between coming to be and ceasing to be. And this totality. This restlessness is itself at rest. It is in quiescent unity. Do you see how that makes sense? Well, as I understand this passage, um, I didn't. I understand it as uh, that uh, when we when we talk about becoming the being and nothing like change they change itself they in, in some way are modified so technically i don't know so, so we get the sublation of becoming I, I'm, I'm not sure about this passage really i can say but if, yeah in some way i can understand it well no 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 remember okay go back to the first beginning at, at first we assume that being and nothing are different and, you know, we, we see them as different. We intend them to be different. When we get to becoming, we have a way to articulate a definition of being and nothing which can make a difference. That is what ceasing to be and coming to be is. Ceasing to be is being. Coming to be is nothing as their respective moments. It is why they like nothing becomes a unity of being a nothing and being becomes a unity of being a nothing. So if being and nothing are this vanishing unity of becoming, that is what you know coming to be and cease to be, then they are just vanishing, right? Being and nothing are actually just becoming. Their truth is becoming. So just think about it in, in the forms of just coming to be and ceasing to be. The truth of being and the truth of nothing is coming to be and ceasing to be. Okay, um, I understand, yeah. All right, so if that is the case, in becoming, there is nothing other than becoming. It's just vanishing. But this becoming equally collects itself in quiescent unity. Now, take it, as, take it as literal. If all there is, is becoming, then becoming is. Becoming is being. Uh, take it in the phrase of, if all there is, is change, then the one thing that doesn't change, is change itself.
Okay. So continuing. Being and nothing are in it only as vanishing. Becoming itself, however, is only by virtue of their being distinguished. So in becoming, being and nothing have been destroyed, in fact. Because they've just been they've been made nothing but becoming. But if they are just becoming, then this destroys the very basis of becoming. Because becoming is only becoming between being and nothing. So if they are just nothing but vanishings, then the vanishing itself, the basis of it, is gone. So the vanishing vanishes itself. Their vanishing is therefore the vanishing of becoming, or the vanishing of the vanishing itself. Right? And remember, there's two vanishings. There's two vanishing moments in becoming. Both of them vanish. So, ceasing to be and coming to be must vanish into being and nothing again. The vanishing must vanish. You cannot have being and nothing which are themselves pure vanishing. Because if you have that, we go right back to the beginning of the logic. That's why he says, this is not nothing as such. It's not the, not the pure nothing we began with. So this is the point about contradiction, that if it is nothing but pure vanishing, then it contradicts itself and cancels itself, it vanishes itself out. But what does vanishing do? It has to vanish into something. So being vanishes both into nothing. I mean, becoming vanishes both into nothing into being. So in the second one, it's a rearticulation. He says it in a different way. He says this can also be expressed thus. This can also be expressed thus, becoming is the vanishing of being into nothing and nothing into being, and the vanishing of being and nothing in general. But at the same time, it rests on their being distinct. It therefore contradicts itself in itself, because what it unites within itself is self-opposed, but such a union destroys itself. So if, once again, if vanishing is the vanishing of being and nothing, but being and nothing themselves are vanishings, there is nothing to vanish. Therefore, vanishing vanishes. You know, vanishing is no more. This result is a vanishedness, but it is not nothing as such. It would be only a relapse into one of the already sublated determinations and not the result of nothing and of being. It is the unity of being and nothing that has become quiescent simplicity. But this quiescent simplicity is being, yet no longer for itself, but as determination of the whole. Becoming as transition to the unity of being and nothing, a unity which is as existent or has the shape of the one-sided immediate unity of these moments, is existence. So the, prob so the problematic is that, that thir in that third paragraph, it's not clear what the result really was. It's clear that vanishing has vanished. That makes enough sense. And so it's clear that something is left over. But he says, it's not the nothing which we began with. This result is a vanishedness. So it's not going back and saying, oh, look, being and nothing are really outside of of becoming, you know, they're necessary for it. Therefore, you know, the vanishing must vanish into them. Rather, he says, since becoming was the vanishing of being and nothing in general and being into nothing and nothing into being, 
it is vanished completely. The vanishing vanishes itself once again. But it's that result which is is the cling the clincher. Uh it, it actually it definitely is not clear what it exactly the result is. This result is a vanishedness, but it is not nothing. As such, it would be only a relapse into one of the already splated determinations and not the result of nothing and of being. It is the unity of being and nothing that has become quiescent simplicity. But this quiescent simplicity is being, yet no longer for itself, but as determination of the whole. So, two ways that I can think of that you can interpret this, once again, from the result of vanishedness. One is you can interpret this as becoming assumes the necessity of being nothing as its own basis. So being nothing cannot be becoming themselves. So becoming is only this transition and finally just fully cashes out the transition. Ceasing to be is being passing over into nothing. Coming to be is nothing passing over into being. And bam, that's it. Once a transition so happens, it's over. You are back to being a nothing. But the difference is now you have a being and nothing, a being which came from nothing, nothing that came from being. So that's one interpretation. And each one is a unity of being and nothing because it came from each other. So that's one interpretation. It's uh, the one that it makes most immediate sense to me. The second interpretation, however, is, I think that goes more along with the text is that this absolute vanishing is what vanishes. But in its having vanished, the result is one, a vanishedness, which is not nothing. It's not a return back to the nothing of the, at the beginning. But it is a result of nothing and of being. It is the unity of being and nothing that has become quiet and simplicity. So this being is a result of the vanishing of being and nothing. and as such is result of the no of nothing and of being so to put it another way this final being this existence uh, at the end here is a being that has become from being and nothing does that make sense so it's not the first beings we began with, and it's not the first nothing we began with. It's a yeah, result. It's a major result. It, it, may, it, makes, it makes perfect sense, but um, I'm just wondering um, differ, uh, differentia differentiation with, uh, with uh, first being and second being, or first nothing and second nothing we get. Okay, the difference. Okay, but if 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 can we say something? I, it's uh, it's abstract terms, so it's hard. But can we say something about properties or something like that? Uh, properties will come in existence. Uh, this is way before properties. No, I, I don't mean like uh, properties as term by itself, but uh, properties of uh, if how can we differ, uh, differentiate uh, between this being and the being we get? Ah, 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 okay. This is a higher level being. This is a being which is both being and nothing. So think of it. Yeah. So think about it. Uh, you have two circles, you know, black and white, whatever you call it. That's white circles being, black circles, nothing. This being 
is a circle in which those two circles, they make that circle. So this is a second level of being. Well, yeah, it seems hard to tell the difference uh, uh, just be, just uh, by, by that that difference is that the second being is a result of this first being. Yeah, you just have to keep in mind the entire process that has gone on. You know, from being being in nothing, then becoming, ceasing to be, and coming to be, and then the final vanishing of becoming as a whole. Yeah, I, I think I think that uh, uh, a problem with my understanding is just just trivial. Maybe uh, it will um, yeah, uh, get maybe, completely maybe, clear. Maybe like the proper term should be used. Like this, this is determinate being, which is made of being and nothing. So, it makes it clear that this is something new being talked about, which includes the relations we've already made. Um, another way to understand it is, um, uh, let's phrase it in terms of becoming. Becoming is vanishing. You know, this coming to be and ceasing to be. Uh, this is the result of becoming, becoming, <laughs> if that makes sense. Becoming, becoming's own self-sublation results in this being, this determinate being. So yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, uh, definitely note down the two interpretations I told you about. Uh, I I used to go with that first interpretation I said, but now I'm, uh, in this reading right now, I'm I'm feeling uh, the second interpretation actually more strongly now. Strangely, but like that second interpretation is just so weird. Uh, some days it makes sense to me. Some days it just does not. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it, um, as you said, it ties more to the text because um, I, I, I think the first interpreta interpretation is uh, more, more intuitive, but uh, it, uh, it, it, it do doesn't follow directly for, from, the, from the text. It's just my opinion. Yeah, it's definitely making more sense to me right now. Strangely enough, this was my first interpretation, but like I, I had like five different interpretations of becoming, like in the times which I was working it out for myself. <laughs> but I didn't have it quite in this way. I had it close, but not quite this way. Um, as I see it, we get some kind of pro product of thinking and. Um... I'm I'm just uh, really interesting in um, uh, an analyzing uh, the, this pro pro product. Uh, what 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 are its uh, differences? What are its? Uh, uh, yeah. But it's, yeah. it's, 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 but it's very it's very it's very hard because. Uh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. It's, not, it's, it's going. This is what uh, chapter two is going to directly build off. But okay, all right, so becoming more or less clear, you guys feel that you, you feel that there's a, you got the logical link between becoming to existence? 
yeah, it, it's a wild roller coaster, roller coaster ride, but. <laughs> All right, so let's just finish out this chapter. Uh, remark, to sublate and being sublated, the idealized, constitute one of the most important concepts of philosophy. It is a fundamental determination that repeatedly occurs everywhere in it, the meaning of which must be grasped with precision and especially distinguished from nothing. I don't know what he means by the idealized, but... Uh, term I, he's defines very late in the book what is sublated does not thereby turn into nothing nothing is the immediate something sublated is on the contrary something mediated it is something non-existent but as a result that has proceeded from a being it still has in itself therefore the determinateness from which it derives So that shows sublation as a negation. It is something sublated is on the contrary something mediated. It is something non-existent, but as a result that has proceeded from a being. It still has in itself, therefore, the determinateness from which it derives. And that's curious. I, did, I don't remember the non-existent part from the last time I read this, this chapter. That is very interesting. Uh, that actually ties in directly to this notion that sublation is the negation of the negation. Because as you can tell, uh, even though vanishing vanishes, therefore negates itself, contradicts itself, uh, this isn't a negation that leads to nothing, it's rather it leads to something positive. Uh, the German aufheben, to sublate in English, has twofold meaning in the language. It equally means to keep, to preserve, and to cause, to seize, to put an end to. Even to preserve already includes a negative note, namely that something, in order to be retained, is removed from its immediacy and hence from an existence which is open to external influences. That which is sublated is thus something at the same time preserved, something that has lost its immediacy but has not come to nothing for that. These two definitions of to sublate can be cited as two dictionary meanings of the word, but it must strike one as remarkable that a language has come to use one and the same word for two opposite meanings. For speculative thought it is gratifying to find words that have in themselves a speculative meaning. The German language has several such words. The, no the double meaning of the Latin tolere, to make notorious by Cicero's quip, tolendum est octavium, does not go as far. Its affirmative determination only goes so far as lifting up. Something as sublated only in so far as it has entered into unity with its opposite. In this closer determination as something reflected, it may fittingly be called a moment. In the case of the lever, weight and distance from a point are called its mechanical moments because of the sameness of their effect. In spite of the difference between something real like weight and something idealized such as the merely spatial determination of line. Yeah, to call it a moment is merely, is literally to just call it a moment. Like, it's just a momentary term that we reflect on. You know, when we reflect and say, ah, this is sublation, we've identified a moment of the thinking that has gone on. Tolere. I wonder if tolerate is tied to that word, because that's interesting. Tolerate is a sublation. Because you tolerate exactly that 
which you don't like and you don't want. <laughs> See, you start seeing this uh, like in everyday things and you realize, oh, what a strange thing. Uh, we shall often not help but observe that the technical language of philosophy uses Latin terms for reflected determinations, either because the mother tongue has no terms for them, or if it has, it does as it does here, because in expressing them, it is more likely to call to mind the immediate, whereas the foreign tongue calls the reflected. The more precise sense and precise expression that being and nothing receive now that they are moments will have to transpire from their consideration of existence. The unity in which they are preserved, being is being and nothing is nothing, only is held distinct from each other. In their truth, however, in their unity, they have vanished as such determinations and are now something else. Being and nothing are the same and precisely because they are the same, they no longer are being and nothing but possess a different determination. In becoming, they were coming to be and ceasing to be. In existence, which is another determinate unity, they are again moments, but different, de differently determined. This unity now remains their base from which they no longer surface on the a in the abstract meaning of being a nothing. So all beings and all nothings from now on are going to be unities of being a nothing. And so you see that the stuff that happened becoming, it's staying. Like being nothing really are a becoming of being to nothing and nothing of being. But they will just become increasingly more elaborate becomings and they will have moments in which they don't appear as becomings. And that is chapter one. Ooh. I don't know. It uh, it seems uh, rather interesting uh, that uh, this this whole uh, this whole process of uh, actual uh, this whole process is actual done done by thinking. It, it's something not said, but I don't know how to express it. No, yeah, and like uh, the important thing is to notice what is going on, because when you notice what is going on, you get you start to grasp what Hegel does and and what he's doing all the time. How many chapters are in this book in total? It's like I think it's like seventy-five. But uh, s still, how, how, do, how can we um, imagine this pro process that is uh, practically happening in this book? Can we imagine just Hegel thinking or something like that? No, I mean, if, if you do it correctly, you're the one who's thinking this. So this is really an exercise in your own thinking. And uh, Hegel's basically just guiding you through a thought process. I mean, it's actually very Socratic. You know, Socrates guided people towards a certain end that he, you know, uh, wanted to get them to. But in this book, uh, I mean, actually, well, it would be just the same as Socrates. Like, you wouldn't know what Socrates wants to lead you to. And Socrates doesn't tell you that he's leading you anywhere. And as far as you can tell, it, so far, it's a necessary, it's just thinking. You're just thinking about being a nothing and you just happen to get becoming. You just happen to realize, oh, becoming contradicts itself and vanishes and vanishing. 
And oh, oh wait, and oh. that vanishing is itself leaves a being, but that being is this vanishing of becoming, which was being a nothing. But um, uh, I, I, I think it's quite interesting that uh, um, I, I, I don't think we can define th this process as, so as something objective that is ha happening in the world. It's it's more like uh, thinking of one subjective person. At, at least that's that's my my opinion. Well, it's subjective in that obviously you are the subject thinking it. But look at what he does with the whole thing. I mean, yes, the beginning, yeah, yeah, is, the beginning subjective. is subjective. Like the but beginning, the distinction no. is subjective, by the way. But as you will notice, when we already have things set. What do we start doing? We're not. Lo we're no longer dealing with subjectivities. We're dealing with what is actually happening in thought. You know what actually happens when you think. You try to think being. Uh, you can't think anything at all. You know. You take a term that fits the character of this, and you say, "Ah, oh, that's nothing. I've thought nothing." You know what is nothing? And then you make reflections on nothing, and it's like, "Oh, nothing is." And you say, "Well, wait a minute. What's happening between me and nothing?" You know. I think being. It becomes. It's. I immediately think nothing, it vanishes, ah, that's becoming. And then you think about becoming, you say, ah, there's a relation between inverted inverted uh, becomings, you know, ceasing to be and coming to be. And you think those out, and you say, ah, wait a minute. You know, if being and nothing are just ceasing to be and they're just vanishing, and, you know, being and nothing are themselves just vanishing, then the vanishing vanishes. But wait, whatever is left from that vanishing is but that is, is not the is which you began with. That is, is a new is, it's a new being, which came from this unity of the vanishing of being and nothing that we began with. Like, these are objective, structural uh, thoughts. Uh, yeah, I agree, I agree with that, but um, you, you can't Im imagine this, you, you can't imagine these thoughts without uh, actual subject. Because in 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 just uh, you can't uh, if if there's no subject there's no thinking going on. Yeah. Yeah. So it's subjective in that sense, but it's not. It's very objective, in in the sense that you know usually we'll teach all uh, treat all knowledge as you know. Uh, it is a objective structure. All these names are just names as far as Hegel is concerned. Being is just a name for the structure we're using. So yeah, so like if he doesn't acknowledge the subject, like well, I've, no, he does acknowledge the subject. He'll tell us when we, when we're making subjective determinations. But uh, this is only like up to a certain point. After a certain point, we start making like purely objective determinations because the, the, we've got all the tools necessary for self determinations of concepts, and this will come at the end of chapter two. As far as are they all media as chapter one? Uh, yeah, there's there's others that are even more. I mean, chapter one is tame. Like we literally had five concepts. Uh, in chapter two, we're gonna get like some. We're gonna get like something like twenty concepts, I think. Yeah, it does take a certain kind of autism to uh, seriously take take on this task to just think through all this stuff. But I don't know. I think like I I like it because once you get when you when you accept this way and you you, you accept this method, uh, you have objective concepts. Like it's no question anymore of like oh you know. You know, you don't really understand existence. Well, if existence is for me this, and you know, for that person, it's like, well, no, I think existence is that. And Hegel says, go, look, man, just follow this process. Is if you follow it, existence is exactly this, nothing else. No more questions about what the concept is. You know, you you you, you stop this whole game of semantics, which a lot of philosophy plays, because what you have is a real, logical, structural movement. And these concepts are nothing but structural relations and, and structures which arise in this movement. 
and you know exactly why certain categories relate gener are related to other categories and you know when they are and when they shouldn't be related and you know exactly why so uh, it does become useful I mean it, at first it doesn't appear as anything but like eventually you start actually thinking this way and noticing it Um, so yeah, you know, unless uh, further questions, comments, uh, we'll leave it here for next time. All right, so we finished chapter one. Uh, see you guys next week.